It's another beautiful morning here in downtown Wilmington, Delaware, and high above Caesar Rodney Square, it's our finale of Poopalooza. And the crowd goes wild. But first, we thank you for your kind feedback and inquiries on podcastpediatricians.com. We thought we'd start this episode by taking a question from one of our listeners. So, a Dr. Richard Fader from Fort Lee, New Jersey, emails, Dear Podcast Pediatricians. Do you get that, Matt? Mm, no. Roseanne Rosanna Dana? Mm, no. Gilda Radner? Uh, you love Gilda Radner. Wasn't she married to uh, Willy Wonka? Yes, and he just recently died. And he but was, not the creepy Johnny not Depp. Not the Johnny Depp. Depp <laughs> yes. So maybe I remember that. I mean, I was into SNL, but also because it was based on Roseanne Scamardella from ABC Eyewitness News in New York. And you were in the hinterlands of New Jersey. And she was on right after the 4.30 movie. We didn't movie. have TV. But do you remember the, what's all this fuss about Soviet jewelry? Why do we need to save Soviet jewelry? <laughs> yes. Or Princess Rodziwell with toilet paper on her shoe. Mm-hmm. All right. It's always something. All right. The real question we have is from Sarah F., a pediatric PA from an independent pediatric practice. And we love those. Her inquiry to the podcast pediatricians, what are your thoughts about video baby monitors? They seem to be a regular item for many families. Matty Ice, your thoughts? I've got thoughts on this, man. You know, I think <laughs> and it's a died of loneliness. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, I, I honestly, I just think that a lot of these monitoring systems are a way to cash in on on parents' paranoia. It's like go to sleep. You know how 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 do people ever survive? You know without these things, God only knows. To me, it's like a marriage of tech and uh, and Madison Avenue, and it's it's unholy. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, I don't agree with you on this one. Really, I mean, I don't talk about. It, I don't recommend it. But if the parents want to have a video monitor as opposed to the old days when I, my kids we had an audio monitor. As long as they realize it's not going to prevent SIDS and if it gives them some peace of mind and they can afford it, that's fine with me. Now, if they keep using it for years and years without the child's knowledge, that gets kind of creepy <laughs> and I have a problem with that. But otherwise, no big problem with uh, if they use a video monitor. Ay, ay, ay. Did you used to play music for your kids to fall asleep with? Not really because then they can't fall asleep without it. It's like using those yeah. swings. You put them in the swing and then uh-huh. they're like, this is great. The swing works great. But – then when they fall asleep and they wake up and they're no longer swinging, uh-huh. they can't get back to sleep. Uh, All right. We talked enough about sleep. We though. did a little bit. We did. Yeah. But a more topical question is about the new smartphone integrated infant physiologic monitors. In an article called Viewpoint by Dr. Chris Bonafide, or maybe it's Bonafide. I like that better. He's a general pediatrician from mm. CHOP. We love articles from general academic pediatricians. His article was published in JAMA in January of 2017, and he noted that in the past two years, the market has exploded for these sensors that are built into socks, like smart socks, or into onesies, or buttons, or leg bands, or diaper clips, and they connect to smartphone apps by Bluetooth and display respirations, pulse rates, blood oxygen saturations, and then have alarms for apnea, fast or slow heart rates, or bradycardia, or tachycardia, and also for low oxygenation saturations. There's no evidence that there's any increased safety for these devices or any role in the care of children from these monitors. Yet, one such smart sock recently reportedly had sales of 40,000 units at $250 each. Mateo, your thoughts? Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know... Just refer back to what I just said. This this is playing into people's fears. You know, we have this mounting population that feels like they have to monitor everything under the sun. What else can it tell you? You know, what's my child's GPA going to be in seventh grade at the local <laughs> private school, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. Truly ridiculous. Let's just, like, let well enough alone. This isn't going to, as Rob said, change anything from the standpoint of the survival rate of children. It's just going to increase parents' need for more and more information about the biometrics of their children. And I'm right I'm right with you there on this one. So the websites of these sellers are very careful not to claim any diagnosis or treatment or prevention of disease, but in their advertising they say that they provide alerts to pay to parents for if their <laughs> <Alert>. child <laughs> write me a check for two fifty. <laughs> 
for if their child stops reading. And that's the code word for SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. So they're not allowed to say SIDS, but they say SIDS in another way. Again, there's no medical indication. And specific AAP guidelines do recommend against it. Now, Matt, do you remember the days of the old monitors for the preemies every time a preemie oh, came out? Oh, my gosh. When yeah. Did they, I mean, I can't remember the last time I've gotten a call on those. So I think that they've diminished in terms of the use by the neonatologists. They do. You know, they keep them there longer and to make sure that they're mm-hmm. not having apps. Attic episodes. Yeah. They send them home on caffeine, but even that mm-hmm. I haven't seen that much. But Did you used to get a, calls in the a, middle of the night like Jimmy Bean just had a, a, a monitor alert for low breathing. He looks fine now. Right. And the, no, and the noise that? it made was just, mm-hmm. just, just oh, right God through awful. your brain. Oh, cut right through you. And you had to try to find a place to download the computer. Yeah, I remember so, that. Oh, that bad was a memories. nightmare. We, oh. don't, we do not want that to come starting back. starting to shake. There have been other medical apps touting increased health. Like there was one for blood pressure that a study showed missed up to 80% of patients with hypertension. Wow. Now, these companies actually could do studies to prove that they help prevent problems such as SIDS. And then they could get FDA approval, but I think they know that'd be expensive, and I think deep down they know that their product would fall short. So they'd rather not do a study and just do advertising to try to get people to think that they need to do this for their child. But overall, okay, so they're selling this stuff. People are wasting money. What's the harm? Well, there is harm with Mm -hmm. this one because these false positive alarms lead to overdiagnosis. We know that healthy infants occasionally desat to less than 80% without a problem, and that their pulses and respirations can go pretty low in deep sleep. But when the alarm goes off, they're going to ERs, and even worse, adult-oriented urgent care centers, and they're getting unnecessary x-rays and labs and admissions, oh, yeah. not to mention all the parental anxiety. We also know that these pulse sac sensors are notoriously sensitive and fickle. How often during your training and after did you have someone come in in front of the child and say they're really worried because the stats are really low and you're looking at the sat and it's like 50 and the kid's pink and looks great and you know it's just not accurate. Right. Right. I mean, we struggle enough using these in our offices to get try to get a decent reading on a child, let alone being some sleep-deprived parent in the middle of the night trying to pick up on the, on the idiosyncrasies of how these things work. Again, not a fan at all, and, and I agree with you, Rob. I think that these are potentially dangerous. The point is, at least the point they're insinuating, is that uh, this is going to save your baby's life, you know. Prove it. Show, show me some studies. That's what, oh, by the way, science is, something that's reproducible. <laughs> this flies away from what we consider to be good care for kids. Completely agree. Do you use pulse socks in your office much for asthmatics? Rarely. That's the other thing. It's We have it, and I think occasionally it could be helpful, but I know if a child has asthma and he's a little bit tight and then I give him a treatment, he's going to have more VQ mismatch, so his pulse socks going to go low. Mm-hmm. And Going into the high 80s doesn't mean you have to give oxygen and send them off into an ambulance. Right. Sure. I mean, you know, it's been touted at least as of a decade or so ago as as the fifth vital sign. You know, this is really something that may be worth our while to follow. And and as you said, first of all, the the lack of consistency, uh, even within an office, even within 30 seconds or so, is really mind boggling. And to use that as as a determinant as to whether or not one should act aggressively enough to send a child to the hospital or not when they otherwise look well or they otherwise look like they're improving. It's a bit of getting hung up in the, the forest for the trees here and not really being able to discern as a clinician when a child's in trouble or not. Absolutely. And again, in a hospital setting, perhaps in chronic illness, especially pulmonary illness, it certainly has a role. And for young babies, I think both of us might use it more in young children in the office because sometimes it's hard to tell um, their oxygenation. But otherwise, it's often more trouble than it's worth. So to recap, there's no medical indication for these physiologic monitors, especially with saturation. There's no evidence of improving health, and there's definite potential for harm. So pediatric caregivers, when asked about physiologic monitors, to quote Nancy Reagan, just say no. I wondered how long it would take you to say that. To quote Nancy (laughs) Reagan. Nice. We'll be right back with our final binge on constipation, I hope. We are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community's standards of care. We'll be right back. For Poopalooza, the end. Hi, and we're back. So this is Matt Gotthold along with Rob Walter. We are the podcast pediatricians. Find us at podcastpediatricians.com. Once again, our disclaimer, 
We are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. So let's get back into it. Rob, what's next on the agenda? We're going to dive right into the treatment. With significant constipation or ankylosis, severe or long-standing, you do the diet changes, the stool softeners, the daily laxatives, but you have to clean out that colon. Now, cleaning it out is easier said than done. In the old days, back in the 20th century, chronic constipation often required high-dose mineral oil or milk of magnesia to clean out these kids, and they hated that, and it often failed <sighs> anyway. That was a god-awful mess. And then the clean-out pre miralax days required an enema, which is a word that strikes fear. <laughs> and not just children, but pediatricians men. as well. <laughs> exactly. Now, if an enema is needed, I always prepare the parents for just how much stool they will see come out of their little darling child. The parents are often stunned by how much <laughs> stool continues to come That's out. That's an understatement. It is. Pedi- They're lax- like a cornucopia of poop. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? <laughs> I do. So over two years of age, there's something called Pedialax enemas. They're saline enemas. Over 12 years of age, it's the Fleet's enema, which has bisicodal, which is a stimulant laxative also in the enema. In recent years, Miralax, which is now over the counter, has solved many of these problems. It can be mixed with any fluid. It's as effective as the regular enema for clean out. It's like doing a colonoscopy prep. In fact, right. most colonoscopy preps mm-hmm. use Miralax now for right. the adults. Right. Yeah. And extraordinarily safe. You're, you're right. I mean, reflecting backwards in terms of what we used to use, essentially the bottom line with constipation is we don't care what we use as long as we get things moving Just along. Just clean them out. As long as we clean the kids out, and as long as we then have a plan, a second aspect of the plan, which, as we discussed, is to continue to keep things moving for X number of weeks or months after that so that the colon kind of responds and and gets back into what's a more normal anatomy. Now, the clean out, and everybody has their own recipe. Oh, we do. And I have one, and I have it, again, in my written handout that I give to the families. So I'm just going to give an example, but there's lots of ways to do this. I usually give the Miralax over two to three hours, and I use for three to five-year-olds, three capfuls and about 15 ounces of fluid. Six to 11-year-olds, five capfuls and 25 ounces of fluid. In 12 plus, 10 capfuls and 32 ounces. Again, drinking over two to three hours. You need to keep drinking all night because it pulls fluid into the colon, and the child can get dehydrated if he doesn't keep drinking. I give Senna or Exlax chocolate before and after they take the Miralax. I use a half a square of the chocolate Miralax if they're under five and a full square if they're over five. Now, one Exlac chocolate square is about 50 milligram of senicides. Again, if you want to do the enema instead, and over two, give the saline laxative, and over 12, gives a bisicolo enema. The goal for complete clean out is loose stool without any pieces of poop, preferably being green. If you get a suboptimal response, then consider repeating it the next day. That's why I like to start this on a Friday night so they can do their cleanup right. on Friday. And if it doesn't work, then they can follow it up on Saturday and they can make sure the child's staying in that week and no one wants mm-hmm. a child to have an accident when they're over a friend's house. Sometimes when I see them back the next week, I do consider again that follow-up rectal exam or a single AP x-ray to confirm the clean out. So remember, the rule number three from last episode, always get that colon completely cleaned out or else it'll fail. Yeah, so my tack is pretty similar to yours, although I'm a little bit more generous with the Miralax initially. So I will usually use somewhere in the vicinity of six capfuls in kids as young as three and kind of increasing as the ages increase. Suggest they put in maybe 20 ounces of, we'll usually use some type of an electrolyte drink. Even though we usually frown on things like Gatorade, et cetera, this probably is an appropriate place to use that because we're going to have them essentially pushing them toward diarrhea here. But not mm-hmm. red Gatorade. Not red Gatorade. That's very disconcerting <laughs> to all involved. That's call. exactly it's right. And I will usually start this first thing on a Saturday morning. So the prep that I tell people is, is first of all, you want to make sure that you have something to amuse your child for at least several hours. This is one place where I'll suggest breaking that two-hour video rule Absolutely. and saying, hey, listen, get something they're interested in watching. Make sure it's near a bathroom because you're going to need it. And you just start slowly drinking this over the span of several hours. You don't want to chug it because you're going to then potentially encounter a lot of cramping and discomfort from that standpoint. And as Rob said, oftentimes we will you know, more or less jumpstart this process by giving them a little bit of Senna ahead of time or a Ducalax, something along that lines. What that does is that stimulates 
stimulates the gut to move while the Miralax, the, uh, the PEG 3350 is doing its job in terms of absorbing water into the intestine and moving things along that way. Now, after the clean out, these kids, as we mentioned, often get daily Miralax for weeks or months. And I warn them that you don't want to wean it too quickly. If they're getting, and I usually use a half or a full capful a day, Mm -hmm. if it's too loose on that, then I tell them to cut it in half. Mm -hmm. And if that's still loose, to cut it in half again. But don't Mm -hmm. go every other day or every third day because you're just letting it build up and you're just going to have the problem happen all over again. Yeah. This is while we're changing the diet. They're talking to the teachers about being able to use the bathroom. We're having them sit on the toilet mm-hmm. after meals mm-hmm. with their feet up on a stool. Imperative. We're going to talk about that in a second. But uh, I do the same thing. What I will tell parents, this is where I introduce a word that, as I've discovered, mostly just people who have a science background understand, which is titration. What I suggest to parents is the day after we achieve that clean out, when everything that comes out of the child is liquid, and now we feel like, okay, the pipes are clean here. The very next day we start with, depending on the child's age, but generally, you know, you can go even for the younger children, uh, one capful of Miralax, and that's your starting point. And then you can titrate up and titrate down to achieve what I tell people is optimally you want at least one soft, comfortable bowel movement a day out of your child. Hopefully looking mm-hmm. like the Bristol type four, <laughs> not like Mr. Hankey, not That's Mr. Right. Hankey the Christmas poo, but Bristol type four, yes. long, smooth yep. stool. Yep, easy to Google the, Google the uh, Bristol scale or get your app. You know, I've had some mm-hmm. parents talk about giving probiotics for constipation. Mm-hmm. And do you do that? You know what? I have used probiotics for any number of reasons, although I must admit it's with with some degree of ignorance. You know, I've I've been recently, as I told you, reading a lot of information about the, the gut flora, et cetera. And even the people who are considered at the very cutting edge, the experts in the field, still only understand a fraction of what there is to understand about the use of probiotics. To my knowledge, there's no downside to this. But I've used probiotics not just for constipation, which I've usually used after a parent has tried it because a friend told them, but I've used it certainly for for infants with what seem to be uncomfortable bellies, you know, for whatever reason, whether they're gassy, et cetera. There was one paper published on this in terms of colic in babies, what at least was considered to be colic in babies, that, that invoked the use of lactobacillus rudieri, which is actually what is presumably the active ingredient in Gerber Soothe drops, which by the way are god awful rip off at twenty three dollars or so for like an ounce or <laughs> Sorry, so. Gerber. Yeah. You How about be- that? <laughs> I do like using probiotics, but I really use it just for diarrhea mm-hmm. and I use it when kids are on antibiotics. What do you usually use? I use lactobacillus GG. And okay. one, one of the brand names is Culturel. Yes. And I mm-hmm. think that what I've read, lactobacillus GG is one that seems to be well rated for these. I also get nervous about using probiotics on young infants because you are mm-hmm. giving them bacteria. Oh, yeah. And, and, and certainly when the really young infants, mm-hmm. there's been some reports about bacteremia. So mm-hmm. I don't use it yet as much right. in the really young infants yeah. or for colic and such, but maybe that'll change. I think this, you know, the use of probiotics and the doorways it opens up in terms of just being able to benefit from the from the good side of bacteria is is next generation medicine. You know, I really think it's on its way. I think that our modern world has really distorted what was really kind of the almost the natural flora of the earth. And here I'm sound a little hippie there, am I not? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> By the way, I'm drinking mushroom coffee right now. <laughs> Tell you about that some it, other time. It tastes but, <laughs> as good as it sounds, mushroom it's, coffee. It's, it's earthy, Rob. But uh but as we as we look ahead over the next say ten or 20 years, I think there's going to be an abundance of information on this, hopefully a little bit more sorted through, and it will be uh, useful for us as people on the front lines in terms of being able to use bacteria to our advantage, you know, particularly in the realm of gut flora. Some kids need more than just to clean out and dietary changes in Miralax. And I think historically, we've always been afraid of using daily stimulants for children long term. But I think we both learned from our pediatric GI colleagues that sometimes it's just needed. Right. And it could be reasonable in a severely constipated child. Now, there's stool softeners like colace, which draws water in the stool. I really don't use it in kids. It does do well at melting earwax. But colace is not something I use much for kids. Again, there's that milk of magnesia, which is disgusting, and I rarely use that. My partner uses Pedialax chewable tablets, which is magnesium hydroxide, with some success on her patients, I want to say, not herself, <laughs> but on her patients. And for that, nice for qualifier. two to six years of age, that's one to three tablets a day. 
And at 6 to 12 years of age, that's 3 to 6 tablets of the PLX chewables. But still, the mild kids with constipation, you get the diet changes, more fluid exercise, and the supplements. If you are going to consider regular use of stimulant laxatives, the choices are Dolcolax, which is a stimulant laxative, or Senna. And I'd rather use Senna. Remember that these are kind of underused. Dr. DiLorenzo kind of points mm-hmm. this out. Like He sees much of the worst patients, but right. we shouldn't be afraid to use stimulants. Now, a Senna side chewable is 8.6 milligrams. And I use, from two to five years of age, a half or one of those a day, six to 12, one or two tablets a day, and then over 12, two to four tablets once or twice a day. So these Senecide chewables are half the dose of a square of chocolate X-lax. There you go. You can use them interchangeably. And a lot of my patients like chocolate. I, like I was, was going to say, you know, it, when it comes to that, and I, and I must admit, I don't use a lot of Senna, and some of it's just simply because I'm so comfortable and familiar with with Miralax, but another part of it is that at least historically, the Senna sides, even though they're they're vegetable based, so they're you know much more natural. You know, if people are looking for that, also have a little bit more predisposition to cause cramping, and and that's something that I'm a little bit hesitant to foist upon a child who's already uncomfortable. And that's always what mm-hmm. I felt, but yeah. I have been convinced somewhat by mm-hmm. uh, good PHGI doctors that we may be a little bit too scared of that, right. and that in severe right. cases, it really doesn't give much cramping. But certainly, yeah. it's, it's possible. Yeah. The other thing I talk to family about that even when they're cured, I keep pounding over and over again, beware of vacation. Yes. Like if you've been cured and everything's fine, mm-hmm. pack that Miralax on vacation. Yeah. You're going to eat greasy food and fried food and there's going to be weird bathrooms mm-hmm. and kids get constipated on vacation. Yeah. I, th- I think another thing that we find ourselves needing to convince people of, and this is true of a lot of things that we pediatricians in 2017 deal with, is this is a much different mindset than what we all grew up with. You know, we we all grew up with the fact that if you overuse a laxative, you're going to become addicted to it, and then you're screwed for life, you know, from the standpoint right. of your GI tract. And interestingly enough, what I try to explain to parents and oftentimes grandparents who are a little bit leery of giving a child something that helps them to go to the bathroom every day is actually what we're doing is we're trying to prevent that from being the issue. We're trying to prevent JW's mega colon from occurring by making or, or helping the colon to work the way it's supposed to. And hopefully this should decrease the likelihood that the child's going to have issues in the future. Absolutely. Now, certainly we are always fearful of laxative abuse, especially mm-hmm. with eating disorders and such. Yep. So it's certainly that's real. Different topic, but, but a yep. different topic. Mm-hmm. Now, we both agree that sometimes we do our best And it fails. And sometimes we can't get that child cleaned out. And they need to get an in-hospital clean out. And that's more common with children with developmental delays and motor issues. And wasn't it some kind of color you mentioned, Matt? Yeah, so this this is kind of cool, and we're gonna to have to get back to you on this. We don't know exactly. <laughs> we don't know exactly what it is. We're gonna to have to get back to this. But one of the nurses who I know well, I have the honor of taking care of her children from our nearby children's hospital, mentioned to me the other day that where she spends a lot of her time is on a floor where they'll do some of these cleanouts. And more recently, they've had some folks come in from one of the Shriners hospitals to work at Nemours at AI Dupont, and they introduced them to the idea of something called a pink lady. Now, this nurse, fabulous nurse, of course, isn't a pharmacist, she, so she didn't know exactly what was in this, but she promised me that she'd find out because she knew we were going to do this podcast. So we will be getting back to you about this mysterious, but apparently life-altering pink lady. Sounds like a bar drink. It does, which is the beauty of it. It probably comes with a little umbrella and whatnot. I do want to mention that there is something called the vibrating capsule that can be ingested to help with constipation and even reports about electroacupuncture, whatever that is, Yikes. in reputable place about constipation. Uh, we have no uh, experience with that. The vibrating capsule. I'm not familiar. It sounds like a rotor rooter or Dr. something. Dr. DiLorenzo. We'll get him on this uh, podcast. Oh, we'll he have to. to join us someday and he mm-hmm. can uh, tell us all about it. Now, as much as we're espousing primary care and curing these kids, both of us, well, I'm speaking for me, but both of us have had kids that we can't cure, that it just doesn't work sure. out. And mm-hmm. that's where they need to see the GI team, which includes 
a psychologist and a dietitian and the GI specialists and GI yeah. PAs and nurse practitioners to work with this family for this chronic right, condition. Right. No end the punt. There's, a, I think a lot of us as general pediatricians have gotten to the point with a lot of our knowledge base and with a lot of what we're familiar with because we've been doing this for a while of really being able to manage the majority of these kids. But you have to know where the, when to punt. And sometimes that punt consists of just a, a difficult uh, situation that you've tried everything that you know of to do and it's still not being solved. And other times, to be brutally honest, some parents really just want to see a specialist. And given that, we certainly want to make the family not just happy, but our bottom line is to make the kid well. And so if that's what it takes, then so be it. And uh, we find this with a lot of the specialists that we we refer to. I would say off the top of my head, probably uh, 90% of the time I'm referring to a specialist because I really need their help. 10% of the time I'm referring to a specialist because we're at a point in our relationship with the family that this is just something that they would prefer. And I think that you have to respect that. Yes, I think Matt and I are both on the same page that we're not gatekeepers. And even if we don't think the child needs to see a specialist, we're not going to prevent that from happening, despite the fact that the insurance companies keep a report card on us. <laughs> and ding right. us for when our patients right. see a specialist. The other thing that also happens, I think, to both of us is when someone self-refers yeah. who doesn't need to see there, mm-hmm. you're reading the specialist note and you're thinking, I hope they know that I didn't send them. <laughs> yeah, uh, more often than not, probably the, thinking like, the oh, specialist God, will say, Dr. Welter's such an yes. idiot. Why did he send this kid? It has nothing to do with us. And I'm like, I didn't send that kid. They sent themselves. It wasn't yeah, my fault. Yeah, that's, that's always uh, a little bit infuriating. Okay, last word on constipation. I touched on the stool and the potty, and Matt loves this. Mm-hmm. Go, Matt. Yeah, I, you know, I really, I will try my best to remember to tell parents that sometimes the most important part, or at least a critical part of this, is putting your child in a position to succeed. And that, and that's not just figurative, that's literal. And from the standpoint of if a child is sitting on a potty, and their legs are dangling with nothing under their feet, it's a very difficult thing to be able to muster a bowel movement out of that. Adults too. Adults as well. Yeah, well, that would be a really big potty for most of us. (laughs) But anyway, you know, I tell the parents, you know, imagine, and I'll like foist myself up on the exam table. Imagine you're sitting up here and you're trying to have a bowel movement with your legs dangling. It's a really difficult prospect. So it took me probably a year of being in practice at least before I heard this mentioned during a lecture. I thought to myself, you know, you idiot. Why didn't you think of that? You know, why don't you? You make this part of your regular spiel to parents when you're discussing constipation. So I urge parents to get some type of a stool under their child's feet when they're having bowel movements, whether they're constipated or not. If they're so short, which most kids are as they're, as they're sitting on the potty when they're younger, that their feet don't touch the ground. I thought you are going to go right to Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Shark Tank, did we talk about this yet or no? I don't think we have, right? I think at a Phillies game we uh-huh. talked about yeah, it. Yeah, so... Weird so, conversation. So <laughs> we have a lot of weird <laughs> conversations at Phillies games. I look forward to them. There is a device called a squatty potty. Uh, at this point, many people in the country are already familiar with it. But for those those of you who are not, it's essentially a an elevated platform that you slide up into the body of the toilet. So it has kind of like a U cut out to it. And what it does is, is it affords you as an adult a better opportunity to have a more comfortable and quote unquote more natural bowel movement. And the way it does this is it, it essentially unkinks that sigmoid rectal f- flexure and allows the stool to pass more naturally. Kind straightens everything's out because your feet are slightly elevated and you're able to essentially, as they say, squat. So if you haven't seen it before, check it out, Squatty Potty. It has apparently changed people's lives, not just the people who invented it, who were really just brilliant in, in terms of presenting this. Uh, and Rob, as my, Rob mentioned, they were on Shark Tank, but especially for uh, people who chronically suffer from bowel issues. And for your little kids, you don't need to buy a Squatty Potty, just get a nice stool a to nice put their stool. feet up on. Yeah. All right. We said that we're going to talk about potty training, and I actually don't have huge amounts to say about it, but I do want to dedicate this segment to Rachel Bloom of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, who in January wrote publicly in the paper about how she did not poop in the potty until she was four years old, and she vividly remembers loving pooping in her own diaper. And then when she finally pooped on the first time, it was on her birthday, and it was all caught on videotape, including her getting presents after she went. So kudos to Miss Bloom for coming out and helping late potty trained 
children everywhere. I'm sure Matt was five or six before he was potty trained. Um, <laughs> have you been no, talking to my mom again? I have been talking to your mom, no doubt. <laughs> potty training. So Matt, when do you start talking about potty training to your patients? Wow, this is, this is so all over the place. I think it's so all over the place because a lot of the times when children seem like they're capable of potty training, you know, people will go even younger than this, but many people will start to ask about it by the time their children are 18 months old. They will talk about the fact that they're parents tell them that they were potty trained when they were younger uh, and other parents are just desperately afraid of the whole topic of potty training. A lot of, I think, the approach to potty training needs to be based not just on the child, but also on the parent's interest in it. So some parents find themselves, especially given certain life circumstances, really not in a position to be able to do this in what they consider to be the optimal way. There are a lot of people out there who will espouse certain views on this. They range anywhere from just take off their diaper and let them run around naked for a couple days, which I've seen work, I got to say, uh, to, you know, hey, listen, we want to wait until they're ready. Well, I'm not sure that that's the right approach either, because that's like asking your child if they're ready to learn to read, you know, or asking their child if they're ready to start doing some math. No, I actually do. Mm -hmm. I actually do like that approach. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty much the only mistake you can make with potty training mm -hmm. is to push it too early. Yeah. And talk about it. I don't even mm -hmm. mention it till the two year visit. I give a handout. Right. But, you know, talk about it. They can get their own potty that kids can watch them. When the kid starts talking about telling their parents when they're pooping and peeing, mm -hmm. that's a good start. Mm -hmm. But it it's is. when they're mm -hmm. emotionally ready, not physically ready. So I'm really downplaying the whole potty issue from two to three. I do talk about that, you know, it's all about positive reinforcement and want to make sure they're not constipated because forget potty training if that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is, we've mentioned like the first episode when there's a million books about something, you know, no one knows what to do. Exactly. There's a million books about how oh, to potty train your kids. There is. Potty train mm -hmm. your kids in the weekend. Mm -hmm. We see the failures. We yeah. see the kids coming in we after do. that week completely we constipated. Yeah. So there's no reason that you need to push potty training on kids. So Rob, I agree with you. I don't mention potty training with any degree of sincerity until the child's at least two years old because I've found- Before that, that you're just insincere. <laughs> <laughs> you know me well. I, I don't tend to mention it with any with any um, encouragement until they're at least two years old. My personal experience with kids has been that little girls tend to take to this more readily than little boys. I don't know why that is. Absolutely. It just seem, seems to be- Like with just about everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> All through life. So when we look at this in that context, Context, what I try to encourage parents to do is to be thinking about it, to be encouraging but not pressing, to take advantage of opportunities to, to introduce their child to the idea of potty training. But as Rob mentioned, one of the great mistakes that parents can make, and there aren't a ton of mistakes that can, parents can make that can be long lasting, but one of the great mistakes is to really push their children into potty training. And unfortunately, a lot of the daycares that are, at least in our area, and I suspect this is true across the country, have certain rules about you can't advance to this room until you've achieved potty training, which really is, I think, counterproductive. Right. It goes against everything we know about child development. But I did talked to someone who owned a daycare once mm -hmm. who said that, you know, in certain buildings, there's yes. certain rules mm -hmm. about if you have diapers or not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes physically where they are in the rules dictate some of the rules they have about moving up and if they're potty trained or not, which... Is that like an OSHA type of thing? I don't know. Or is that I don't know. just, or or just, just self-imposed? She was just selling me a bill of goods there, but uh, well, I get I've never that thought certainly, about that. You know, from a practical standpoint of the daycare providers, it certainly makes mm -hmm. sense to kind of sequester the kids who are trained versus the ones who aren't. I think we do, to an extent, a disservice to the kids by doing that. The other big source of pressure are grandmas. And I specifically oh, yeah. say, again, it's when they're emotionally ready, not physically ready, no matter what grandma says. And mm -hmm. often I'll say that with grandmas also in the room, right. I do talk to patients. If they're not potty trained by three, that's normal. And then they come in and they're three and right. they're not potty trained. <laughs> and certainly the, the, the change to me when they're three is that you're still not going to push it too much. You don't want them to get constipated, but that they have to try. Mm -hmm. And that not just getting rewards, but if they won't even try to sit in the potty after meals, that's where you can start to have some consequences for not trying, like mm -hmm. losing some play time mm -hmm. or some screen time right, right away for not trying. Mm -hmm. Because it does change a little bit when they get to three to me that they have to at least work at it. 
here's something that I was recently doing some reading on this. And this author, her specialty is, is potty training. It's what she does for a living. And what she had suggested not doing was saying things like, it's okay, let's not worry about that. Not making it okay if a child wasn't successful, but more or less saying like, hey, listen, we're going to work on that. Or you know, being positive, but not making them think that anything was okay. Because your goal really is to have them potty trained. And so that doesn't mean be a cruel and evil parent. But on the other hand, constantly reminding kids that things are okay, which seems to be the curse of this generation. Right. Everything's fine. You know, there are no rules. May be counterproductive when you're trying to potty train a child. That's a good point. I have sometimes, I think I read this someplace, use the magic pull-up mm -hmm. where I will have the parent cut a hole in the back. Usually kids who are peeing the, in the potty but won't poop, they cut a hole in the back and they let them sit on the potty mm -hmm. in their pull-up. Mm -hmm. But obviously it comes out and right. sometimes they look down and a light bulb goes off mm -hmm. and it works. Now it usually doesn't work right. and I don't want them to cut up too many pull-ups. Right. But it's a little trick that you could sometimes use to get you through to the next visit until no. they're finally potty trained. You know, it's so interesting that you bring this up because I just literally today wrote this process out for somebody. So the issue was it's a child Actually, he's, he's a little boy with Down syndrome. He is doing a, a fine job of urinating on the potty. He gets those cues, but he really doesn't want to poop on the potty. So I told his parent that one of the processes that I'll use is, fine, you know, you want to go in your diaper. Let's make sure that you understand that when you have to poop, then you go into the bathroom to poop. It's cool. You can keep your diaper on. Just that's the, that's the room that we poop in. So you do that for a couple of weeks. The next step oftentimes is, hey, listen, big boys, big girls, sit on the potty when they go. But it's okay. You can keep your diaper on or you can keep your pull up on. And then, interestingly enough, just what you said, then comes the part where you can go one of two ways. You can either get them comfortable with sitting on the potty at that point and then remove the diaper, or you can go with what you call the magic diaper, which is there's a hole in the back and they just go right through. And it's it's magic, right? Right. And then you've essentially achieved what you want to achieve. And I, you know, we don't claim to have invented this process. I think I read about it in the contemporary pediatrics probably about five or six years ago, and I thought, brilliant. Right. right? Because right. what we're always looking to find in pediatrics is some little trick, some little pearl that's going to A not hurt a situation and can only help it. And B, you're going to get buy-in from a child and not a lot of resistance from, and it just makes everybody's life so much easier. Yep. And uh, I like the way you kind of do it gradually and go through the whole process. I yeah. have not done that. I, I should do that. Now, sometimes, again, there is no progress. And the children's over four. <laughs> and, and sometimes you do need to get a good behavioralist involved. And certainly, again, kids with neurologic issues and delays may not ever achieve full potty training. This is really tough yeah. on families and you just do your best. Now, I used to run the aneurysis center for a while, so I have a special place in my heart for that. And certainly I keep telling people, it's fine to pee during the night and mm -hmm. I don't even address it till six or seven. And a lot of these late kids who are still wetting at night are deep sleepers, mostly boys. Some right. of them have more allergies. We'll cover that in behavioral approach and buzzer alarm at another time. But last word on potty training and the whole poop issue. Where do you stand on cloth versus disposable oh, diapers. Oh, this is a loaded gun, man. Yep, and you got it. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I got to say, I, I I appreciate the fact He's that, dancing now. Uh, well, I'm thinking. You know, Just whenever, keep dancing. When, whenever somebody says, that's an interesting question, <laughs> what they're really saying is, is, I need to think about this for a couple seconds before I answer, right? I will openly admit my family used disposable diapers throughout the course of all three of my children's um, infancy and toddlerhood. They're convenient. They are kind of neat and clean in terms of you can fold things right up and throw them away. But in retrospect, one of the things that perhaps we could have done better, even if we continued to use disposable diapers, is there's no real reason necessarily that if the poop is semi-formed that you can't dump the poop in the potty and then fold the diaper up and throw it away. Not that that is necessarily a tremendous advantage, but just from the bulk of your trash, from the fact that you're putting a lot of human feces into landfills, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I mean, one might ask whether or not that helps to break things down. I, I don't know my chemistry that way. But well. not the blowouts. But not the blowouts. The blowouts have got to stay <laughs> they go where outside. they belong in, in the dump. And not, uh -huh. and not in our patient exam. But, right. And and I don't know, both Rob and I are old enough that what our parents used were, were cloth diapers. The diaper service? Absolutely. Diaper service. My mom would wash them in the washer. I can still remember kind of, you know, seeing her hovering over the toilet, dumping out the dumping out the load, and then poking me with the with a pin 
pins. You remember those old, old school pins? I do. This is pre-Velcro. Do. She didn't poke me. Sorry about that, Mom. A lot of the parents in my practice who are trying to be more uh, more natural, more, um, more eco-friendly, will use the types of diapers that essentially have snaps on them and you put an insert in that I think is almost like a gauze type of thing. Yeah, so those yeah. are the ones mm-hmm. that I think are the best. Right. And they, they just seem to, the outside shell is reusable mm-hmm. and you're not throwing them in a landfill. Right. It seems the inside part is not that much. So right. Volume-wise, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's got, it's got to be better. And mm-hmm. I, I think there's different brands out there. I don't have one to mention. It started popping up about five or six years ago. Right. And I just think that's yeah. wonderful. I wish I had that when my kids were little because right. I think that's the best of both worlds. Of course, I don't plan on having any other children. <laughs> and so... Uh, Is that hey, what I say? That, that's good, what she said? Good luck. <laughs> right. But, uh, but I'm impressed by the fact that people are thinking about this type of thing. We promise we're not going to talk about poop <laughs> for a long, oh. long time because we're tired of it too. <laughs> At least another episode or two. And no. I, I'm never tired. No poop. After a short break, a quick word about chip. Not from my two chips. sons. <laughs> Son chips. Punch. Are you there? <laughs> Check. We both feel very strongly that this podcast is about pediatric care, which is a bipartisan issue that we all care about, and we take great pains not to be too political. But we did want to take a moment to show our support for children's health. So, Robbo... Did you write this, Robbo? <laughs> is that what you want me to call you from now on? <laughs> now that I see, say it's it, like, no. Is it, wait, it, it, this 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 is like this is against the rules. You can't give yourself a nickname, <laughs> Robbo. Um, but I did. <laughs> you did some lobbying for the AAP. I did. I did do some lobbying. And again, as you've seen on this podcast, we don't always agree with the AAP policies, especially the dumb ones. We certainly feel it's an organization that truly speaks for kids. Last week, they had an AAP legislative conference in D.C., and I was proud to be a part of it, and there was advocacy sessions for vaccines, nutrition programs, and children at risk. But the main thrust of the meeting was to ask our congressmen to extend the funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, that helps children get insurance coverage who don't quite qualify for Medicaid. So Matt, guess what percentage of U.S. children are now covered with health insurance? You only know this because you went to the conference. Exactly. Right? I had no idea before. Okay. I'm not, okay. I'm not, I'm not I'll say smart. 85%. Pretty good. The answer is even better. This 90, is me pack, patting me yeah. myself on the back. <laughs> 95% of all children in the United States of America have health insurance which is the highest percentage ever in our nation. That includes 9 million kids on CHIP and another 36 million on Medicaid. Wow. So so how many children does that leave uninsured? 5%. <laughs> do the math, man. How many people are in the, how many people live in this country? What, what was the last? Math. Like 300 and like what, like 360 million or something? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we need to look that up. We'll look that up. CHIP is truly bipartisan. It was conceived by Orrin Hatch, who's still in Congress, and Ted Kennedy, may he rest in peace, in 1997. Delaware actually has 97% coverage of children. Alabama also has 97% coverage. Wow. And just goes to show this is not a red state or blue state division issue. We need to keep it that way. We hope any pediatric caregivers out there listening to this will let their elected officials know that it's important to our nation's future that our children have health insurance and to fully fund CHIP and not take any money away from Medicaid to do it. This should be a priority. Almost half of all people on Medicaid are children, but these children only represent about 20% of the cost. So Medicaid and CHIP for children is incredibly cost effective, and these healthier children become better educated and higher earning adults. To me, it's an embarrassment that the United States of America doesn't guarantee health care to every child in this country. Child. Innocent. At the very least, the children. Oh, my gosh. Remember the it's, children. Yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible to me. But um, nonetheless, let's push on. And, and lastly, the other thing that gets thrown out there is about having job requirements. Eight out of ten families on Medicaid, someone's working in that family. And the rest of them are usually single parents watching their child or disabled. So remember, CHIP stands on the shoulders of Medicaid, and we should support both. That's my little public service rant. Thank you, Matt, for allowing that. I'll, I'll uh, 
I, um, I'm, I'm in full agreement there, man. We will be back soon with a timely episode on allergies and a rant about direct-to-consumer telemedicine. As always, thanks for listening and give us your feedback on podcastpediatricians.com. Say goodbye, Matt. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day. Podcast Pediatricians Productions. All rights reserved.